So with us today, we've got the Athletics Manchester City correspondent, Sam Lee, and also data writer Tom Harris as well. We'll also hear from our La Liga correspondent, Dermot Corrigan, later on in the pod. Sam, let's go straight to you. You were at Kenilworth Road last night with a super unique view. I mean, I've looked at some of your posts on X. You had grandstand seating to see Erling Haaland in full bloom yesterday. Just how great were those goals? Yeah, um, it just kind of like he's rediscovered the magic. Like it's hard to say that because I think he's got what twenty-seven goals in twenty-nine games this year, so his numbers are obviously still holding up. But you know, watching him all season, I mean, I've got a pretty good view all season to be fair. But obviously, last night was extra special upon that gantry. Um, it, it just seems like you know he, when he goes through on goal, there's not quite that certainty, that inevitability that he's going to do it. Um, even in the last few games. He's kind of bailed City out at times, but obviously against Chelsea, he missed all those chances and people was like, what's going on? He didn't quite look himself, but yeah, he was fully back at it last night and he kind of recaptured that inevitability of last season. And that, you know, because City, I don't think City are in their best form. They can't control games in the way they usually like to. But if he scores goals, not five, obviously every game, but if he scores like that, takes his chances like that, they might get by anyway. Yeah, I mean, naturally, Guardiola um, would have been quite pleased with that performance. What did he have to say after the match? It was mainly just questions about Haaland, really, and he just kept shrugging his shoulders as if to say, well, what do you want me to say? Like, he's really good. Um, <laughs> but he, he did say, actually, in terms of, you know, the control of matches, when he because he likes to stray into match analysis, even when he's being asked about something else. And he said, when we played one-touch football, we lost it. But when we took three or four touches... We've moved their structure around. Luton lost control and then we could attack at the right moment. So it is obviously for him all about doing things at the right speed, the right tempo, um, taking the right amount of touches. Sometimes it is one touch, but obviously last night it was three or four. That's the kind of thing they do need. But it was just, I mean, imagine being Mengi last night having to mark <laughs> Haaland like that. It was, I actually felt happy for him in the end when Alvarez came on because every time City played the ball to Alvarez Mengi won everyone but when Haaland was on it was just a different battle altogether but yeah Guardiola was just shrugging his shoulders and if they say look he's he's a great finisher De Bruyne is great uh, in terms of his vision and it's a deadly partnership that was yeah. it basically yeah, I mean, I mean Harland. I, I was looking at quite a few clips of him post match as well, and I mean, you still get the sense that this this is a lad that believes in himself. But he also alluded to sort of the partnership with him and De Bruyne, saying he, what he was a smart guy that he likes playing with smart guys as well. Yeah, well, you, I think again when I talked about Alvarez coming at the end, and obviously Alvarez is very good, but you see. Like De Bruyne, there was an opportunity towards the end because he was one of the few, like I suppose you could say, big name starters that stayed on for the whole game. When the other subs came on, there was one chance at the end when De Bruyne was kind of roaming forward and he he just kept holding on to it, holding on to it, holding on to it, as if to say, like, I'm going to dictate this scenario. But also maybe there wasn't quite the right runs there. And then without Haaland being there, you kind of realise, yeah, like he he is the one that's got this partnership with De Bruyne and obviously with De Bruyne being out for so long this season they've still you know, like I said I think arlen has got 27 goals so they've still mm -hmm. managed to supply him but the City players apart from Kovacic they don't like to play those passes behind the defence they're you know they're very safe mm -hmm. by nature after years of Guardiola coaching and they're still trying to adjust to that but when you put the two of them together you really see it is almost telepathic there's a clip from last night one of the Haaland goals he doesn't even look at the ball he holds off Mengi plays it back to De Bruyne and spins him behind. And he doesn't he doesn't know that the ball's coming. It's only when it kind of appears in his vision as it comes past him that he could run onto it perfectly. But he's just got that trust that the ball is going to get there. And obviously, De Bruyne delivers on that trust and he, he does put that ball through it. It's a bit of a revealing angle, actually. Like he doesn't need to see it. He just needs to make the run and, and trust that De Bruyne will find it. Yeah, for sure, Tom. Well, you know, Haaland loves breaking records. Manchester City love breaking records. And uh, yesterday he became the first player to score five plus goals in a, an NFA Cup match for a top fight club since George Best. Um, he did six against Northampton in 1970. Um, but you also noted, Tom, that, you know, he was close to matching another huge haul at Kenilworth Road for, for a City player. Which one was that? Yeah, it was a bit of a strange one, this, because if he would have scored the sixth goal and made it 6-2. Um, Dennis Law also did that for City <laughs> away at Luton in a 6-2 in win in the FA Cup fifth round. So it really would have been a, a very odd occasion of uh, yeah the stars aligning on that one. But yeah, just to like hint on what Sam said, it, you know, his physicality, Haaland, is just, it unlocks so many different avenues for City. And that kind of duel with Mengi, there were so many times when 
Mengi was kind of drawn up to the halfway line and scrapping with Haaland. Then the space in behind Haaland opens up for other players to to run into as well. So even when, you know, even if he would have scored once, twice yesterday, City probably would have won that game very comfortably because of Haaland's impact at the top of that team. Yeah, it's an impending feeling of deja vu at this point, Tom. Kevin De Bruyne is back, Haaland backfiring. You feel City are just beginning to see their full potential after so many injuries and such a, I wouldn't say a shaky start, but not as consistent as they would have liked anyway. Well, it's good timing um, if if that is the case, because if you look at the fixtures coming up, I mean, Man United this weekend, which is always an interesting game, mm. then Copenhagen midweek, which I think now looking back on it, that third goal, just to give them a bit of breathing space, probably very, very welcome. Um, Anfield next weekend, then Brighton away, then Arsenal at home, then Aston Villa. Mm-hmm. The last two teams, obviously teams that have already beaten City this season. So, yeah, it's um, it's it's looking quite interesting. And, um, yeah, just on Haaland talking about De Bruyne being smart, I mean, just um, like that run that Haaland loves to do where he kind of peels around the outside of the, of the right centre-back and receives the ball on his left foot. De Bruyne, as Sam alluded to, is one of the few who can do that so consistently and kind of weight the pass perfectly so that Harlan can just take the ball in in his stride and, you know, he's in the box with the ball at his left foot and, and, you know, there's not many many keepers who are going to be able to stop that when it's being fed as consistently as it it was last night. Yeah, Sam, let's um, do a quick one on Jack Grealish. Um, Sad to see him injured again I I, 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 I take it um, but mm. Guardiola has also had some words to say about his consistency this season as well and he's had quite a, a, a shaky season as well any more on that? In terms of the injury no he, I mean he put on Instagram last night I hope my injury isn't too serious which obviously you would say that but also I don't feel like you would actually put that if you thought you were going to be out mm. for a while so hopefully um, for him and for City it isn't too serious because like I kind of alluded to earlier, in terms of controlling matches, taking those extra touches, not rushing things, attacking at the right tempo, that's what Grealish helped City to do. He was a big part of them winning the treble last season. I mean, he kind of even helped in his first season when people said he should do more in the final third. Like, he was still holding the ball up and doing that kind of stuff that City really need. And obviously, without Gundogan, who left in the summer, Mares as well. And with Grealish being in and out with injury, and to be fair, not playing well either, they miss players like that. Stones has been out as well. So they that's where they they're lacking control because the players who've come in and replaced these guys, you know, Carl Walker pushed up in the final third instead of Stones going up there. It's not the same. You got Doku instead of Grealish. It's far more direct. He's not as good defensively. Alvarez instead of um Gundogan, far more direct, not as good defensively. So City is still obviously good because all these players I've mentioned are quality players, but they don't control games in the same way. And that's why it was looking like after Grealish got injured against Copenhagen and then came back last night, you think, oh, okay, well, that's good. He can, he's got this opportunity to kick on now and that's what City really need. But yeah, Guardiola's been dropping in some little hints for weeks now. In fact, in August, he said he's missing brilliance in the final third, which was interesting at the time because Guardiola's always backed him up and defended him. And then as soon as he gets to the top of the mat, he wins a treble. Guardiola's like, well, you need to do more in the final third. And then, yeah, he's talked about his attitude. Even... Last week, when asked about his injury, he said, well, the fact that he got injured after 10, 15 minutes shows that he's not properly fit. So he's always been hinting, you know, Grealish is maybe taking his eye off the ball a little bit. And that's why he's not been playing. That's why he's not been fit. Um, but apparently, again, Guardiola likes to drop these things in once they passed so he can make his point. But after he got injured in Copenhagen, he said, yeah, it's a shame because in the last few days, his attitude has been much better. So again, he's been dropping these breadcrumbs for a while now that Grealish might have taken his eye off the ball a bit. Um, but... At the end of the day, City are going to need him to sort it out and, and come back and help them control matches like they, like they normally do. Otherwise, I don't think they'll win the Premier League. Yeah, well, let's let's move on back to Erling Haaland because, you know, right at the top, we were talking about Real Madrid. And um, I, I guess it feels a bit strange to start talking about Haaland's future at this point in time. And the season's not done and Guardiola still to, to sign a, a new contract. But talk us through this one. Let's get some background to it, Sam. I mean... What has the interest been from Real Madrid pre-City? And is there even any more interest now at this moment in time? But the best way to put it is that they've always preferred and prioritised Mbappe to the point where obviously everybody thought that um, City would... uh, Sorry. Everybody thought that Real Madrid were going to get Mbappe in 2022, 2021? The the years years failed me. 2022 it would have been. Um, But at that point, 
they didn't prioritise the move for Haaland because they thought they were going to get Mbappe. And in that time, um, you know, decided to go to City, which he was obviously very happy to do, and he's and he's very happy there. Um, but again, now they're going to get Mbappe. Um, there's different release clauses in Haaland's contract. I reported last year that one that would have been valid for this summer, 2024, got removed because it was tied to Guardiola's future and because he renewed his contract during the World Cup. Mm. That clause was removed. But then it's kind of irrelevant anyway if Real Madrid don't have the finances to do it this year. And I suppose the other thing is, we're just always assuming, in Britain in particular, don't we, that Real Madrid will always have the money. They will always find a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, the other interesting thing with that is, and I'm sure Dermot could shed a bit more light on this later on, but uh, apparently the Madrid board, some of them were thinking well, they don't necessarily need Mbappe. They don't need to spend all that money. They've got a good group of players um, on relatively low contracts like Vinicius Jr., um, Brahim Diaz, people who are kind of apparently, according to the Madrid view, they've rejected bids from elsewhere to and bigger bids to go and play for Real Madrid. They've got that love of the club, even at Real Madrid, even if not everybody on the board is on board with it, if they go for Haaland next year. But of course, that then comes down to him and how happy he is at City. And City would like to offer him a new contract and I don't think Haaland's against it. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, does it feel like he's settled? Because I, I, I know there's always been speculation about, you know, City player Sergio Aguero, for instance, how long would he stay? People end up staying over <laughs> around a decade or yeah. so, you know. Well, even Guardiola. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, is he happy at City? Yeah, very much so. Um, I mean, I think he's just one of those guys, like he's a he's a kind of happy guy on the around the place. Obviously, you, you can see his, his body language sometimes if he doesn't get a pass in behind, but... Um, that's all kind of part of it, but he's a, he's a really good guy in terms of encouraging, motivating, good on the training ground. Um, yeah, just a good character, and he he, do, he does enjoy it. You know, there's there's been even just going by the little clips that have been put out publicly. You know, just his act like when he does an accent at John Stones or something like that. He's, he he gets on well with his teammates. He likes it. He he enjoys playing for City because he genuinely did support them growing up. Because obviously his dad played for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I think he is open to signing a new contract, but I think it's just very complicated because of all the clauses that were put into the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to have to see how that one goes. But the other side of it is, I think everybody knows he wants to play for Real Madrid. And I don't think that's ever going to really go away. Um, but all City can do is, like they did with Aguero, like they did with Guardiola, just David Silva as well. Just you know, keep making it an environment where they want to stay and, and play football and obviously earn lots of money, but mm-hmm. have a good environment and, and enjoy at City for as many years as possible. Yeah, and Tom, I'm just thinking about this player, player that loves breaking records. I mean, what he did last season alone and what Manchester City did last season alone is is absolutely phenomenal. You couldn't begrudge him, really, for wanting a, a, a newer challenge. But how big a blow would it be for City? Because, look, let's also face it, City are used to rebuilding. City are used to reformatting, you know, as a club. Yeah, I mean, the numbers speak to themselves, really. I mean, that's... 94 goal contributions now in, in a City shirt. He's played about 73 full games if we divide all of his minutes by 90. So that's pretty ludicrous. And um, yeah, obviously they've kind of had to adapt the way they play in order to fit Haaland in. It would be quite a reversal if they had to unadapt to then to see him leave and probably bring in a player because there aren't many other players like Haaland in terms of that combination of physicality, the pace, the you know, the devastating finishing, who you could bring in who would be like him. So they would, you know, it would necessitate another rebuild. Um but yeah, I mean I think the thing is with one modern football is that it like moves so quickly that, you know, in, in a year's time, in two years' time, there'll probably be players who we're not speaking about now who mm-hmm. will be, you know, in that position at City will be looking at them. They've made the step up, they've had a big season and, you know, you just don't really know where we'll be at that point. But yeah, just having such a relentless player at the top of a team like this, you know, he, he's just a chance magnet. And even if he does occasionally misfire, as he has been doing over the last couple of weeks and months, and it doesn't really matter because, as as Sam said at the top of the show, he, he's going to carry on scoring regardless. I mean, the interest is real. You did say it, Sam. Um, should City fans be worried anytime soon? Well, no. I mean, this is the this is a kind of. A, response to the question to Tom as well like we can talk about how they can rebuild without him but I don't think there's any immediate danger of it happening again it's kind of subsided a bit but when Haaland signed like Alfie his dad did an interview with that well it was like a documentary for Norwegian TV and he was like yeah why why wouldn't he go and play two and a half years in France two and a half years in Spain two and a half years and do everything and there was just always that feeling especially with all the reports about release clauses that maybe he's not going to be there for that long but we've seen during his time at City, that he does love it. 
and it's not going to be you know just two years and go. Um, but you might see if Real Madrid finally get Mbappe, you might start seeing the covers of Marca and Us next autumn mm-hmm. and and winter with Haaland on on the front page again, and it, and it kind of cranks up again. I don't think they, they don't need to be too worried now. Um, that spectre of Real Madrid is always there, but also just in terms of replacing him. It's a weird one because he's obviously brilliant and he scores loads of goals, but mm. I think City are at their best, they're at their most solid, or they can be without him. And I know, I know they won the treble with him last year, and he was a big part of that. But they needed to change so much to fit him in, mm-hmm. and that's why this season, even though he's he's got almost a goal a game, it's like he needs to get more than that. He needs to do what he did last season and even more because if you don't contribute as much outside the box as the other players to give City that stability, and you're not having many touches in the game because you can't get involved. You've got to take your chances when they come because otherwise, why are you on the pitch? If City can't control the game, partly because you're you're on the pitch and then you're not scoring when the chances come your way, you start to think, well, why is he on? And he's on for that moment where the ball gets played in behind these one-on-one like he did against Brentford or when the ball dropped in the box against Everton and he, from a corner and he smashed it in. That's what he needs to do. So he's held to this ridiculously high standard but it sounds very harsh but I fully believe it Like he, he basically does need to score in every game to justify all the changes he's made to that City team or when he was out in January in December Alvarez played and Alvarez was much more capable of dropping dropping deep and Stones was injured but they didn't notice it so much mm. because Alvarez was giving them those extra touches like a false nine used to do so if Haaland were to go it wouldn't be the end of the world by any means obviously as long as Guardiola's there then it's fine once Guardiola's gone then you got Way more questions to answer. I mean, Sam, it's easy for us to say, but scoring every single game, I mean, that is some intense pressure. <laughs> I mean, it is, but like, if look, he obviously does other stuff. Like, his pressing's okay. He does link up outside of the box, but there's a reason he sometimes has six, seven, eight touches in a game. Mm-hmm. And it's because they say, well, you do that. And look, he occupies centre-backs and all this kind of stuff. But if, if, you, if your biggest job in the team by far is scoring goals and you don't contribute as much as the other guys do and City changed the way they play and you know talk about their players like Bernardo being missing Grealish being missing Gundogan gone Mara's being gone if they had a striker who could link up outside the box like Harry Kane it wouldn't matter as much but because he can't the onus is on scoring goals so when he's not scoring goals and it is very harsh and like I probably couldn't say this to his face, but I do firmly, <laughs> I do firmly believe it. Yeah, good luck like, with you've that just one. Got, you've just got to score the goals, mate. Like you've got, you've like it's not just one job, but it's like you've got one job. You've got to do it because City are almost bending over backwards to to make this all work. You've got to hold up your end of the bargain. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. All right, Tom. Let's let's just think of Dreamland, right? Let, let's mm-hmm. let's say he does go to Real Madrid. Um, Vinny, Mbappe, uh, Rodrigo, Bellingham. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how do how on earth? I mean, it's a tactical nightmare. But but can it work? I don't know how it can work, but can it? Is there anything the data can show us to to make sure this team purr beautifully with all those stars? I mean, it's already been quite a stretch trying to work out how Mbappe fits in this team, yeah. to be honest, because they all like that kind of space on the left. Um, Vinicius thrives when he's out wide and he's he's isolated 1v1. He can drive into the box. Mbappe's played a bit more centrally this season for PSG, but he also likes to drift over there. Haaland, as we were saying before, obviously he can score with his right foot, but he prefers to be in that kind of left space so he can shoot a cross goal with his left. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> But if any if anyone can do it, I mean, obviously Ancelotti's famous for his kind of mm. big big name management within teams. You know, you look at the AC Milan team and all the the superstars he had in there, and he managed to keep them all happy and rotate. Done the similar kind of thing really this season when they brought Bellingham in, and you look at that midfield. There are six midfielders there who could get into any team in the world, and he's managed to keep it all moving smoothly. So, yeah, like you say, this is very hypothetical, but it would, yeah, I, I wouldn't like to be the manager of that team. Yeah, Sam, I was just thinking about what Guardiola said. And obviously, they, they play various formations and they all play very differently depending on the opponent. But, you know, he talks about Kevin needing Haaland and Haaland needing Kevin. Can you see that kind of, you know, midfielder playing that ball to Haaland for Real Madrid? Because you also need to be unself. You need, you need to not be selfish as a player if you're playing that De Bruyne role. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um in terms of Haaland, I think he's unselfish enough that he mm. wouldn't kind of demand the service in the same way. You might not see the best of him in that sense, but also, you know, if he was playing with those other quality players, 
he wouldn't have a problem squaring it to Mbappe if Mbappe had the open goal, for example. Um, in terms of Real Madrid, no, I think it, it would be different, wouldn't it? But, you know, Haaland signed for City because he'd established his reputation as like a fearsome goal scorer and he's never had to play De Bruyne's quality to do it before. So I don't think it, it's it's necessary. And again, De Bruyne missed most of the start of the season. Well, yeah, he did miss the start of the season for mm. three or four months. Um and Haaland was still getting the chances. He was still he was still scoring goals. So they can do it in different ways. But again, that's because that's because City were especially adaptable. And obviously in the past he's had different service at Dortmund. So it's not reliant on a player like De Bruyne. But obviously the question then is how how adaptable is the Real Madrid manager at the time going to be if these guys ever play together? Yeah, because it's and... not easy to put that. You know, we saw it's it's kind of different because of the characters. But we saw it at PSG when Messi mm. signed. I remember being asked that. Like, oh, they must be favourites for the Champions League. I was like, well, who's going to do any pressing? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And then that's going to be a, that would be a challenge for Real Madrid if they did sign all these guys. Mm. I guess Tom, what what complicates this whole equation? He's actually killing Mbappe. I, I don't know. Does does Haaland feel like a, a a better signing for Real Madrid than Mbappe, for instance? Just because you've got that central focus, which allows you know your two wingers, Vinny on one side, Rodrigo, who've been sort of interchanging as well, and then sort of Bellingham just sitting r- r- right behind. Yeah, potentially, but Real Madrid have put all their eggs in one basket. <laughs> they, have, <laughs> they have done that for the last two years. And Mbappe, you know, is who they want. And obviously he has as well. I mean, we've seen clips of him recently. He's, I mean, I think it was Karl Anker who said he's no longer a footballer. Um, and that is kind of true. He's He's got just an unbelievable kind of reputation in and out of the game that that is kind of what Real Madrid like in terms of the commercial value as well as the player value. Uh, Haaland doesn't bring quite what Mbappe does, so potentially there's something like that kind of involved in it all. But yeah, maybe in hindsight, Haaland might have been the best player, but you can't say no to Mbappe. Mbappe will do exactly you know what he needs to do in that team to 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 get the best out of him and to get the best out of the other players, and I'm sure it will all be absolutely fine. Yeah, Real I mean, I, I'm just a <laughs> jealous fan who will never be able to attract such players to our team. Anyway, let, let's move on because... Um, you know, Sam alluded to it as well in terms of Haaland not being, not firing as as well as he did last season. Injuries permitted, but what does the data say about, you know, his stats this season in comparison to last season, Tom? Yeah, I mean, it says that he's, he's not finishing as efficiently as he has done in previous seasons. So we can take a kind of cumulative number of his expected goals and compare that to how many goals he scored to see how clinical he's been. And this season he's slightly underperformed, so the chances that he's had suggest he should have scored slightly more. Whereas in previous seasons he was, you know, scoring seven or eight goals more than the quality of his chances. So yeah, it is a big dip in terms of, you know, if we compare him to himself. But across Europe, you know, we can kind of plot his goal scoring and it and it is still right up there. I think the interesting thing is that with Haaland this season, he's actually creating or well, generating more chances than he ever really has done. Mm-hmm. So per game, he's he's generating more XG, he's having more shots, he's getting into more dangerous areas. And for a player like Haaland, kind of, as as we mentioned before, regardless of how he's finishing at that time, he's still, over his career, proved himself to be an amazing finisher. So if anything, it's kind of a positive that he's, you know, even though he's not scoring as much as he usually does, the fact that he's getting into those positions suggests that he will score a lot more in the future. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with these players, I mean, if you've ever, you know, played football yourself and tried to fling yourself on the end of a cross, you'll know that it's so easy to get it wrong. Mm. And with the players like Haaland, it's all about kind of decreasing the chances of getting it wrong. Um, you know, Haaland's very good at making sure that he gets a solid contact on on the on the cross or that he's in that, you know, he makes that movement to get ahead of, of the defender so he's got a bit more room to take the shot. These are the kind of qualities that define good finishers so when you've got someone like Haaland who yeah as I said decreases that chance of missing when he gets more chances he's going to score more goals so yeah I I don't think it's it should be a worry you know that Chelsea game as Sam alluded to was a bit um a bit of a a one-off you know he's not going to have nine shots in a game and not score very often but you know when you've also got that ability to score against Brentford out of nothing really score that corner against Everton win those points you know it's all going to kind of level out over time and yeah, with with a player like Haaland's numbers, I don't think there should be really any worry. But as Sam said, yeah, maybe it's it's more about kind of timing the goals mm. rather than scoring the number that he does. I mean, it's intense pressure and it's probably why he gets paid for football and we don't, mm. Tom. <laughs> anyway, um, Sam, um, you, 
we'd say the stats are slightly different from last season, but in terms of the rhythm, you, you've got to have some sympathy for a, a player that has been injured a lot this season as well. In terms of Haaland? I, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, sympathy and sympathy, yeah, uh, the injury. And also, like, he lost his grandmother like mm -hmm. two weeks ago, not even that. Um, and, you know, Guardiola said he's, he's, had, a, he's had a difficult time. Um Absolutely, in in terms of um, you know coming back from from two months out, you're not going to be the sharpest. Um, and, you know, also I think you know, Guardiola always talks about this, but it's always the smaller guys when he talks about it. Sterling, Foden, and Mahrez, they could be injured, come back straight away, and they're all right mm -hmm. because their physicality, or they just need a couple of sessions to get back into it. But with the bigger guys, it takes them a bit longer. And obviously, Haaland is a bigger guy than those. He's probably mm -hmm. the same as three of them put together. Um, so yeah, for sure. But I mean, what I, what I'm saying about his his role in the team is that will be the case whether he's just coming back from injury, but he can have a cut him a bit of slack, or last season, next season, whatever. Like you know that that is his role. That is what he does in the team. So he needs to hold up his end of the bargain. Um, but yeah, of course, like if we're looking at the last four or five games since his injury. You go, okay, well, he's obviously not that sharp. But also, we can talk about it because as Tom highlighted with his stats, you know, earlier this season, he's not finishing at his own level. He's still finishing very well compared to the rest of Europe. But by his own standards, he dropped a bit. And like I said earlier, it's just that sense of inevitability had gone a little bit. And we wonder now, um, after kind of relighting the fire against Luton, whether that will be back now and it'll take off. Yeah. Tom, I, I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of potential successes to Kevin De Bruyne, I guess Phil Foden sort of fits that mould to a certain degree um, and how they've been developing him at City. Can you just tell us in terms of, you know, a, a left-footed Phil Foden, does he get the same sort of passing angles as De Bruyne, for instance, um, if we are thinking of moving away from the De Bruyne assist to, to Haaland? Yeah, it's an interesting theory. I mean, Foden has created 16 chances for Erling Haaland since Haaland last scored one of them so uh, he doesn't see it doesn't seem as natural in terms of you know you saw those there was two goals that he scored yesterday against Luton where De Bruyne kind of plays the perfect pass for Erling Haaland mm -hmm. which is running onto it onto his left foot into the penalty area and there was a game last season I think it was against Newcastle like the Etihad where Foden kind of created two chances for Haaland where you know because you're a left footer going to Haaland's right foot, he's either got to take it onto his right and shoot or he's got to cut back onto his left and shoot. And those extra kind of couple of seconds sometimes can mean that he's closed down a bit quicker. It can mean that he struggles to get the shot off as well as he would have done on the other side. So it's a very kind of small point and across, you know, a season, you're going to get different kinds of chances. You know, Foden might be cutting it back for him or crossing it into, you know, onto his head. But yeah, there does seem to be just that kind of perfect synergy between De Bruyne and Haaland, which makes him so lethal in that basically every single time De Bruyne plays him through, it is it is a perfect pass. Yeah, for sure. Sam, I know you've got to go, but um, very quickly before you do go, I, we have to talk about what the future does look like for Kevin De Bruyne. Um, what's the latest on that? Uh, there are some conversations around Saudi Arabia. Can you just give us a little bit more on that if possible? Yeah, so they approached him last summer he wasn't interested. It was a huge offer. It was about 70 million euros a year, which is, I think, is what they offered. Al Halal, in particular, offered um, Bernardo Silva that. And he said no. I think De Bruyne said no as well. Um, I'm not sure if that was Al Halal as well. But he definitely got an offer from Saudi Arabia, this oblique way we speak about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's fu it's fully off the cards. Um, you know, I don't think it's something they're especially open to. But it might appeal. He's, his contract is up next summer. I think from City's point of view, there's no point in looking at contract talk just now. He's just come mm. back from a serious injury. Um, he's got a year left. If we look at what they did with Gundogan, and Gundogan said when he left for Barca, the main reason he didn't sign a contract is because City just left it until really late. They didn't make him feel feel especially valued. And this was with Guardiola saying, look, this guy's brilliant. We need to keep him. So they've got their own way of valuing players. They didn't think Gundogan would maybe have much longevity um, going beyond 34. By the time De Bruyne's contract ends, he'll be 34 they might feel that it makes sense to wait and see. I think it does. But obviously, Saudi Arabia, with Michael Emanalo, who signed De Bruyne for Chelsea, um, he's obviously now the, the sporting director of the Saudi League. He's keeping those lines of communication open. Um, so they may try and capitalise on, 
on City not yet offering a contract, which is sensible. And then it just depends on how rushed City feel to say, okay, well, we want you to stay for another year. We'll give you this. But maybe they don't want him to stay for another year because maybe they determine that beyond 34, he might not be the same player. So it's an interesting one. Yeah, nice one, Tom. Thank you very much uh, for your time. And just before we go, uh, Tom, I guess all this kind of is pointing an arrow as well to what happens with Pep Guardiola. I think his contract's up in 2025. There might be an extension. Haaland's staying, De Bruyne's staying. Pep's going to be quite central to a lot of those uh, decisions as well. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, I think the fact that Pep is, is such a winner um, and that he, he's constantly, I mean, I think Pep is driven by innovation and, and trying to change things and trying to keep things going. And, you know, all of the challenges that you face as a manager with teams changing and injuries and players aging and constantly trying to keep things fresh. Guardiola is obsessed by that. And, you know, as long as he can transmit that same energy, um, you know, to the players like the big players like Haaland, De Bruyne, all of these people, even when they are winning, and they have kind of done everything. As long as that energy is there and that desire to improve is there, I think the big players are going to want to stay. So, yeah, Guardiola is very important. But also, you know, there are probably going to be a couple of exciting managers possibly coming out of the woodwork in the next couple of years to keep an eye on. We've seen Xabi Alonso this season come out of absolutely nowhere. Mm. You know, who knows what the footballing landscape is going to look like in, in three years' time. But for now, it, it's all about Pep. Yeah, for sure. Tom, Sam, thanks so much for your time. And don't forget to rate and review the podcast. And we'll definitely be back tomorrow for another episode. Appreciate you listening. If you like this video, click subscribe for more content like this. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Lanker, and plenty more through the season to bring you the inside track to the biggest stories in football. If you'd like to listen to the full episodes for free, search the Athletic Football Podcast wherever you get your podcasts from.